There we go. Uh, so we shared this last week, but we'll share it each week. Um, and so this evening's leadership workshop is on servant and situational leadership. Uh, some of you have seen parts of this now. This will be your fourth time. Uh, and so therefore, being your fourth time, um, it's going to be a little bit different for you than those of you who are here seeing it for the first time. Um, some of this information will be familiar. Some of it is brand new. Uh, and so what I ask is when we're in the breakout rooms, when we're sharing out, um, those of you who have seen this before, it's your opportunity to both um, model uh, the behavior we're looking for and the contributions we're looking for, as well as creating space for others to contribute as well. Um, and while we're certainly going to be talking about servant and situational leadership tonight, um, one of our, our hopes here is that you will take away from this um, that what we are, are sharing tonight um, is something that will be uh, continue long after tonight. Um, and you all will be practicing it um, at every meeting uh, with our new members at every Robots After Dark um, and really the rest of your lives. Um, so I'm excited tonight that uh, Mr. Gupta is here to, to present um, along with myself. And Mr. John is going to be making a guest appearance later as well. Uh, so that will be fantastic. All right. What I want to start with is sharing with all of you that um, this team is always playing two games at the same time. Um, and, and a quote I like from my previous career in, in software development, um, but but rephrase kind of to apply to first robotics, is that it's a series of resource limited, goal directed, cooperative games of invention and communication. So I lifted that definition for software development, and I think it applies just as well to first robotics. The two games that we're playing is the season we're in. Um, where we're trying to achieve our, our goals and objectives for that season and looking ahead to the next season. Um, and this is reflected in our, our team values as well. We prioritize the first goal um, or the first game rather, which is this season, um, but we can't ignore the second season. Um, we have to find a balance between the two of those because we want to meet our goals and objectives for this season and we want to achieve and value the sustainability that we're looking for for future seasons. Um, and that ties all in uh, quite a bit to these ideas of um, servant and situational leadership. All right. So let's kick off this session and uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining. And uh, I think with uh, this particular slide, we want to lay the foundation of what we're going to talk about. And all of the leadership sessions uh, we are having is, is focused on, of course, two particular layers, right? Your individual, how you perform, how you gain the skill sets, and at a team level, how does that impact the overall culture and performance? So there are some building blocks or, or, or pillars which we want to touch upon. A uh, couple of aspects we're going to dig in deeper when it talk about servant leadership and situation leadership. Uh, there's obviously a lot of other aspects which uh, lead to team performance. You know, hard work, the skill sets you gain, how you uh, basically strategize and perform at the competition. But when it comes to the overall team culture, which is what drives the overall, overall behavior of the team to cohesively perform. That's based on a few four areas we want to specifically touch upon. The first one is emotional intelligence. Uh, a lot of you may already be aware of this. What is uh, equivalent, I won't say equivalent, but talked about in, in context of what is called IQ versus EQ, the intelligence quotient versus emotional. And this has been proven to be a little bit more focus recently given how teams perform, how you individually perform uh, or manage your emotions and how do you manage, assess and manage your overall team as well in terms of social awareness and skill sets. 
So this has become critical in terms of how you perform in the team and in your future when you uh, go to work or uh, you know start your own organization or whatever you do in the future. And servant leadership is one of the other pillars we're going to obviously touch upon, which is focused on prioritizing your team members, how you build uh, that relationship and trust, and of course, uh, how you empower them to do their task and lead to that overall team performance. The situation leadership, that's the third pillar, which is focused on, again, adjusting your leadership style based on a couple of factors we'll touch upon. One is, you know, what is the task at hand? How is the team member, hey, he or her has a skill set or the confidence to perform? What is the situation you are in? You know, critical versus risk and all those other aspects. And all of these situation leadership is going to be critical as you move from the early stage of your robotics uh, you know, you build your robot versus performing in the competition or, or teams. And the last aspect is self-explanatory when it comes to knowledge sharing. This knowledge sharing is, is not just limited to the knowledge sharing you do within this team. It's the knowledge you gather and share for, you absorb from past performance. You share with future teams as well. You share outside this robotics team uh, to the overall community, the build the robotics uh, you know, as a mission or vision we have, right? So all of these are critical to collectively perform now and in the future. So these are critical in terms of both success for as an individual, as a team, and as an organization. Organization, organization in this case is the school, right? And in future, it will be your work, your community, wherever you will choose to perform. And we always say culture eats strategy for big first, and that becomes true more and more as you build a, a much more strength in these particular areas, which then leads to your overall team outcome. So let's double kick on, on the emotional intelligence aspect. Uh, again, this might be something new for even the uh, uh, most of you who have attended this session in the past. And even though you may be aware, we just want to make sure that you are aware of how this, this EQ in your own life as an individual, as a team, uh, you can practice. So there are essentially four quadrants. The left-hand side is focused on your own self-awareness, awareness of emotions. This particularly means that you know what emotions you have, you know how to label them, you know how to uh, you know, what situations create those emotions. So you're sort of aware of them up ahead that this will cause you to react in a certain way. It doesn't have to be negative. It could be even positive outcomes in terms of your own emotion. And then how do you manage those emotions? How do you manage once you're aware of those emotions in different situations? So all of these leads to self-performance as well, because if you overreact, or underreact in some cases, you may lead to negative performance. Even, for example, you know you were you were working on a robot and you made a quick fix, and guess what? You you got on the table and started jumping because you made that achievement. That might even come out as negative to others, right? So you just have to be aware of the fact that you know you overreacted for a situation which may lead to uh, issues for others. So this leads to the other, other side of the equation, which is the team or social awareness. How do you, how can you read other emotions so that you can uh, not avoid, or I would say not avoid, but avoid uh, the fact that you would ignore their outcomes or emotions in the set, same way. So uh, leading to your team members, even reacting to your coaches and mentors, uh, understanding you know what kind of uh, outcomes they want, and then manage those relationship because you need to build a level of trust with them. You need to make sure that emotions are high when, especially when you're under stress. This could be in competitions. You could be, you know, you're packing at the last minute. You're trying to fix electrical wire at the last stage. How do you manage not only your emotions, but uh, look at the other 
situations or their team members' emotions. And this sort of ties to the servant and uh, situation leadership we are going to talk about as well, right? So all of these areas are very uh, critical to the, or the foundation layer of what we'll talk about as a servant leadership and situation leadership mindset. And, and when tens tensions are high, this is very critical. So let's summarize what we, we have been talking about in emotional intelligence, right? Why is it important? Uh, it's important because it you can manage your own emotions and then leading up to the social awareness and it leads to a positive team culture, which is what we were talking about at the at the top layer when you have these foundational elements. Um, when you are able to understand your own emotions, you can lead that towards creativity. You know, um, you can channel those emotions toward creativity. You can see failures as opportunities to improve, and you can, and this can lead to more active listening for others and motivate other team members. You know, if you understand other emotions, you might see, you know, they are down, they're not feeling motivated for a particular task or an outcome. How do you understand their situation and help them perform on the task? And this can all, always lead to uh, maybe what we call the right decisions, right decisions in especially tough situations. And last but not the least, the team culture is based on all of these things we're talking about to build a strong trust and relationship so that you perform as a cohesive uh, team both during the development phase and during the competitions and outcomes, right? So let's look at our second pillar, which is focused on servant leadership. To connect back with one of the key messages from last week, um, we want to remember from the servant leadership perspective to begin with the end in mind. Um, so looking ahead to our competition season, our build season, when the challenge is announced, we start planning our strategy, start planning our robot design, we start planning our marketing, we start planning our the take we're going to take for impact, um, because all of that is driven by our goals and all of that is driven by the objectives we're trying to achieve. We have a plan. Um, and so we do begin with that end in mind. Um, but let's look at it from another perspective as well, which is what is our end in mind when we're, when we on the team as leaders, um, are working with new members, um, or just working with other members on the team? What do we want their experience to be like at the end of the season? If we, um, were to ask them, or if they were just to volunteer, um, hey, describe how our team works. Um, what would we want them to say? And so be before we jump into this any further, um, we want to get some ideas from all of you. See what, what you think about in terms of servant leadership. And so I've opened up a poll here, and I'll switch over to that in a moment. Um, but we'd like you to submit uh, just one response per person. And that response should have three words separated by a space. And we'd like those you to choose three words that you would use to describe a servant leader. Okay. I'm going to switch over so we can see that as it goes. Oh, here. It would also probably be helpful if I were to share with you the link in the chat to all of these handouts, which is this link. And that link will take you to this poll, but to make our life easier, I will also put the poll in the chat directly as well. I meant to do that at the start. I totally forgot. All right, here's some more responses coming in. Now that I've actually shared the link, this is great. You can see great descriptors here and some words showing up multiple times.
all of these are wonderful, but we see things like supportive, sticking out, adaptive, compassionate, selfless. These are great. If you're still thinking hard about what your three words are, that's totally fine. I'm not going to close the poll or anything. I'm going to leave that open, um, but I am going to switch back to, oh, I did close it. Just kidding. There we go. Back up. Um, I hope. Yeah, it's still there. Good. All right. So from a simple perspective, we can think of servant leadership as doing what needs to be done to move the team forward. Okay, so primary focus, allow the team to keep moving forward. Um, and, and we can think about this from the other perspective as well, which was, well, what would not moving forward look like from a team perspective? Um, and, and thinking about how not moving forward would work like, we could then apply that um, in our interactions with the team to make sure we do keep moving forward. Um, and just as a reminder, we're playing two games. So we wanna keep the team moving forward, both in terms of the current game, the build season, um, as well as the next game, subsequent years. We have to balance both of those. And so a big part of what we do as servant leaders is we identify and we remove obstacles. That's our primary jobs. Um, so if, if someone were to ask any of you, hey, what's your job on the team? Your primary job on the team is to identify and remove obstacles, um, even if you have other roles on the team as well. The way we do that is by listening and responding thoughtfully to others on the team. Because the obstacles may not be immediately apparent to us. We may have to discover those obstacles by listening and responding thoughtfully. Um, someone may not explicitly tell us of the obstacles that are present. And so that makes being servant leaders a little bit more challenging. So here's a, a wonderful quote. Leaders are more powerful role models when they learn than when they teach. So pause for a moment and think, what what does that mean to you? So as leaders, we always have a lot to learn. Team members will always bring us, bring us problems. And every problem is an opportunity for us to learn and then communicate how we can keep the team moving forward. We will find interesting ways to, to break things, um, and we will find very interesting ways to create things, and all of those are learning opportunities. Um, and so look at them like that and know that, hey, this experience is gonna help me be a better leader in the future when I can apply this experience in new situations. As servant leaders, we will be pleasantly surprised with what our team members can do, and we will be sometimes surprised with what they can't do, and those are learning opportunities for us to be better servant leaders um, and be able to help remove those obstacles and help our team overcome those challenges. So let's... That's a, so that's a little bit about, you know, the servant leadership in terms of how we define it, but let's take a look at the question of why are we servant leaders? And I think it's great to go back to our mission. So this mission was written at last year's leadership workshop series in the final session that was uh, facilitated by the team captains, not by mentors. And the outcome of that session was a new mission statement for Husky Robotics. Um, and so I'll give you a moment to read that rather than having me read it for you. There's a few sentences here. And when I read this mission statement through the lens of servant leadership, the following phrases stand out to me. 
members' personal and professional growth, innovation, sustained impact, sustain a team, annual model, inspiring the future leaders. Those phrases in our mission seem closely aligned to our objectives, which were also defined last year um, in the final leadership workshop series facilitated by the captains. So the four objectives we defined for last year were maintain and build relationships with the community, strengthen our robotic family, prepare a team for the future, and become a world-class robotics team. Um, and in the final leadership workshop series um, this year, we will revisit uh, the mission and objectives and goals facilitated by our captains as well. So you can look forward to that. All right, so let's let's we need a we need a break. We, you all need an opportunity to to talk a bit with each other, and so I want you all to have a a deeper discussion here about with all of these concepts we've just talked about. Um, what experience do we want a new student joining the team to have? Um, what do we want them to remember about their very first season in Husky Robotics? And based on the answers to these first two questions, how does that affect the way you lead? Uh, you may be in a breakout room with people you don't know. Um, there may be people here this evening who aren't on our team, so make them feel extra welcome. Um, so start by introducing yourselves to each other, and then when we come back, we're going to blast our answers um, to each of these three questions in the chat. These three questions are in the handouts that I pasted into the chat, so you can reference them in your breakout group. And I'm going to click on the button for breakout rooms here in just a moment. Make sure I've got my time set right. Give me one second here. We've got people in all the right places. This looks great. So I'm going to open these up. Now, as a, remind member, as a reminder to how this works, you get five total minutes to talk. The countdown timer is going to count down from four minutes, and then you get like a one-minute warning for five minutes total. So when you get that one minute warning, you can continue your conversation. That's just to give you a heads up so you're not interrupted at the end. You do get the full five minutes. All right, opening the rooms now. See you all back here in five minutes. All right, everyone, welcome back. So let's share some of these ideas out in the chat. So let's focus on the first question first. So feel free to type in the chat, hit return. I'll read some of these out for everyone, but let's focus on the first question. What kind of experience do we want a new student joining our team to have? Franklin's focused here on lots of learning, hands-on practice, robotics changing them for the better. Sounds fantastic. Other ideas we've got for what we want, what type of experience we want for our new members? Welcome, have fun. Everyone's open and approachable. Yeah, robotics is their path. There are many different paths in robotics. I'm back next week. Absolutely. I love that. Bolsters creativity, inclusiveness. Yeah, all levels of knowledge. You don't have to know anything about robots. Feel welcome. Let them be passionate. Ooh, feel like they've had a real impact. I like that too. How about our second question? What do we want them to remember about their first season? Yeah. 
yeah, we, we can, we can, we can inspire them with share our passions with them. That's a huge part, I think, of robotics. All right, we want them to remember how upperclassmen and leads included them and welcomed them so that they do the same thing. Love it. There's so many opportunities. Ah, point and say, I did that. That is cool. Contributed to success of the robot when they're when it's on the field. Relationships, skills, come back next season. Yeah, we're team first. Ah, they've changed the way they approach problems. Ooh, I love that. That is fantastic. You get out what you put in, friendships they make. This is great. All right, so based on all these incredible ideas, I love all this, this experience we want our new members to have. How do all of these answers that we've just seen affect the way that we all choose to lead? How does this influence the way we lead? We lead so that they feel they're participative and the feedback is valued. They don't feel controlled. Be understanding, that's huge. Make training hands-on. Start with simple tasks. Give them help, be approachable. Ooh, and if you don't know an the answer to their questions, help them find it. Oh, I love that. That's a great way to model vulnerability and growth mindset. All right, I think we're going to we're going to touch on many of this. So I think the reasonable question at this point then is how do we do this? How do we be servant leaders? Um, well, here are four ways we do that. And we're going to touch briefly on on each of these. Um, we listen and respond with empathy and compassion. We'll dive into that more. We explain, demonstrate, guide and enable, and you'll notice some of those letters are in orange. Um, we apply, share, and rationalize the tools we use to build our team's culture. We call that our team player mindset. So we'll see that in a moment too. Um, and as we talked about at the beginning, as servant leaders, we learn. So question for all of you all in the chat again. Here, um, related to uh, empathy and compassion here, This is all based on the first step as a servant leader is to listen, is to listen. The second step is to respond thoughtfully based on that listening. Um, we have to do that first before we know what needs to be done. And so the question I have for all of you is we have here pity and definitions for each pity, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Which of these are needed for servant leadership? Just blast them into the chat. Hit enter. We'll see where we're falling as a team here. I'm seeing lots of empathies. I'm seeing lots of compassions. I'm seeing some empathy and compassions. Um, this is this is fantastic. Yeah, we 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 need empathy and compassion. Um, empathy is really important. That gets to that emotional intelligence we started this evening with. Um, the, when we are 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 seeing something through someone else's eyes, we're trying to put ourselves in their shoes. Um, we're feeling what they're feeling. We're aware of that acutely. Um, and, and that's an important 
part of our emotional intelligence. Um, having that's important. Having that helps us be better listeners. Um, having that that helps us better respond thoughtfully. Um, but as servant leaders, uh, we need to go beyond just being empathetic um, and also put that our empathy into action. And that's what compassion is. Um, understanding what it is they're feeling and then acting in such a way um, to, to make them feel better. Um, so we need both of those parts as we go. Another technique that we use is edge. Um, we talk about this a lot. Um, I know many of you have, have seen this before, either in robotics or other contexts. So edge, each letter in the acronym um, is a different step in the process. And so um, we start with explaining. Um, and what I like to emphasize when we talk about explaining, it's not just how we do something, but why. The why is so important. Um, it's, it's really critical. Whenever you find yourself explaining, look around, see who else might benefit from that explanation and pull them in. Okay, it's a, it's a fantastic learning opportunity. Uh, demonstrate is about showing how we do something, showing at the appropriate place. Again, look around whenever you're demonstrating who else can be pulled in to learn at this moment. The G is for guiding. Um, the guiding is when we are patient. Um, others are performing um, the task. Uh, and we're providing immediate and specific feedback without taking over that task. Um, and then eventually enable. Um, and when people are ready, uh, we make sure they have the tools to succeed and now they can be more, more independent. As we pro progress from E to D to G back to E, different E, um, that per where we start and where we progress and when we progress is different for every person, for every task, okay? Um, so it's, it's not like we are at a certain point with a person, we're at a certain point with a person and a task in a given moment. Um, both the teacher um, and the student have to mutually decide when to move to the next step. Um, they have, it has to be a consensus or else it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and even when we get to enable, we need to make sure that um, the learner has the tools they need to be successful, has the resources they need to be successful. Edge is a great example of how we focus on the second game. Um, again, back to this idea of we're playing two games at the same time, we're focusing on the future leaders um, and members of our team. The other thing that we share, and, and all of you are here because you're leaders on the team. Um, and so yes, EDGE is our responsibility as leaders on the team, but EDGE is everyone's responsibility on the team. Of course, we as leaders um, should know when to and how to employ EDGE, um, but every team member um, should also be familiar with EDGE, which is why we focused on it on our member skills um, earlier this preseason. Um, and if you have the confidence to say like, hey, I. I I'm not ready to be enabled yet. I need you to guide me some more on this before you walk away. Um, how wonderful would it be if like a new member says that, right? So that's where we're at. All right, we have an example for you. So I am going to make sure you can see everybody here. And I'm gonna set the stage here. Um, before we, we go on. And the stage is that the assembly team is working on the robot. Mr. Gupta is assembling a max planetary gearbox for the intake. Um, Mr. Schmidt uh, hands Loctite to Mr. Gupta. So I'm gonna step into my role here. Don my robotics cap. We've got safety glasses on. Oh, Mr. Gupta, uh, be sure to use Loctite. Hey, Mr. Schmidt, before you go, oh, yeah. it, it looks like Mr. Gupta might need some demonstration and guidance on Loctite. Yeah, I have completed the competency table for most of the assembly skills, but not Loctite things. Oh, uh, so sorry. Uh, I, I should have checked the competency table and asked what you needed before I started to leave. Are, are you familiar with why and when we use Loctite? 
Actually, I'm not sure. So maybe let's start there. Hey, uh, can I join as well? I haven't learned how to use Loctite either. Of course. Uh, so we use the Loctite. And so Mr. Schmidt continues to explain the why and the when and the how we use Loctite, um, then demonstrates how to use it with the first screw, and then guides both Mr. Gupta and Mr. John as they each apply Loctite to a screw and assemble part of the gearbox. So that is what edge looks like. All right, let me see if I can share my screen. Is that working? Looks great to me. Okay, I had to move to the slide we're on, sorry. Should have started there. Okay, there you go. All right. So after that handsome presentation, you know, showing our acting skills, I want to use it as that example for the situation leadership as well, because that example applies to everything we're talking about. First of all, the emotional intelligence we talked about earlier, you know. Mr. John, in that example, identifying, you know, what Mr., uh, you know, the person having handed the Loctite is not able to assess by that person keeping quiet does not mean that, uh, you know, they know or not know, you have to sort of read the emotions as well, right? And uh, then respond to those situations. So that's basically leading to the emotional intelligence we were talking about, both for self and for the team. Uh, the servant leadership mindset where Mr. Schmidt is able to say, all right, let me help you out, right? Let me empower you in that task, even though I have other things to take care of, but maybe the situation needs uh, to make sure that the skill level of a team member is up to the level where they can perform this task on their own. So that in that example, you know, uh, keeping your emotions in check and helping others is ex exactly what we're going to talk about as part of leadership uh, style and situation leadership. There is adapting to the different situations you have, and these situations can change based on the task you have. Um, in this case, if uh, there's a simple task to be performed to, you know, uh, assemble some part of the robot versus complex tasks, which is completely new or innovative way of performing where even the most expert team member hasn't done that, you may take those into factor, right? And the same thing applies on the say, you know, the skill set. It is something where it's common for the team member has, has done uh, these tasks before. Uh, has that person been trained on it? Does it that person require some guidance in the previous example as well? And the motivation as well, you know, that task may be simple, the person is already trained, but what if they, you know, there is a certain aspect of, you know, that person has to be motivated about this task. You know, what if um, the team member is thinking, oh, you know, these are simple tasks, why am I performing this? Why can't I go not work on that complex or some innovative way? But based on the allocation of what needs to happen, that person may need to do this job. So you need to have that person see why this needs to happen you know, motivate or, you know, give them the context of performing that task. And then, of course, the urgency or the safety of, for that matter. Mr. Smith highlighted, I think we had an example last year, we were talking about, you know, if it's if it's a task which is, um, uh, is complex and may uh, cause the robot to fail or may have a certain situation where you are in the middle of a competition, some wire becomes loose, you know, you're not going to simply allocate that task based on to train somebody. You might say, this needs an urgent situation. We need somebody as expert. So it needs to be performed by uh, either you or somebody who is already familiar with that situation. So you have to, you have to adapt to this. And uh, the last thing I would say that the, the, over, the, the situation evolves over time. Your situation leadership style may differ at the beginning of a certain initiative like you know you're designing or building a robot but as you get close towards the you know the completion or competition stages you might adapt 
uh, differently because there are more urgent situations or more uh, teams member have been more performed or skill set the level they can maintain. So taking those examples, there are four different levels of situation leadership. Um, we can take the examples of how you are starting in the new season, you have new team members coming in. So you may start to direct those new team members to learn how to be part of the team, learn all the different tasks, uh, the teams, the sub teams or various minor subtask at the same time. So you're training the resources as you go along, right? And, and this doesn't mean that it's only for new resources. You have existing team members who may be switching jobs or who are taking up new tasks, you need to train them. Uh, so once that happens, you start to get to the level of coaching. Coaching essentially means that they have gained some knowledge, but you know they may or may not be able to have the confidence to perform them. So you time and time again, come back and make sure that they are performing the task or maybe monitor or have them report the status uh, for those activities. The, second the third stage is supporting. Supporting means that, again, this is where they have the skills now to perform the task, and you may make sure that, you know, the as far as doing it for the first time, end to end, they might be something, something they're handling very fresh. So you are essentially making sure that they are providing them some supporting role in terms of guiding them. And the last piece is, of course, you know, relevant to yourself and to others is that you're expert on the team uh, where a certain person can go and perform the task on their own. All you need to tell them is what the task is uh, and the outcomes you want, and you simply delegate them to do the job. Uh, so maybe you can go sleep under the desk, you know, take a nap. But, uh, but no, I'm just kidding. You, you go need to go do your own job, but not take a nap. So all of these things lead to the uh, situation leadership throughout the, the phases, and this is a good sort of visual way of thinking about this. You know, what are the different uh, types of uh, situations you might run into from delegating, supporting, coaching to directing? And how do you assess, and again, taking the whole emotional intelligence of self and uh, others and the servant leadership mindset to assess what the person or a team member is at? Are they at the beginner stage? Are they at the mid stage? Are they expert? Taking that, all of these factors, you may adapt your leadership style to that situation. Now, of course, nobody is walking around like an NFL coach and taking this, you know, have have this in front of them every time a situation comes up. But you know, you need to be keep all of this these things in the back of your mind so that when does the situation arrive, you can practice that. Okay, uh, keep that uh, uh, things in mind, and then it becomes sort of a habit for you. Then most of the people, I'm sure Mr. John as it work and uh, others, we don't think about these different leadership styles because we have thought about, we have practiced this enough to sort of adapt that uh, as long as we have, we are aware that we need to keep these things in mind, right? And keep our emotions under and check to be able to assess the situation uh, and then perform as a leader. So one thing I do uh, want to ask, Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Schmidt, if you don't mind with the, with the group here, last time we brought up situation leadership uh, as a concept. So for anybody who was part of the, the training and the team from last year, do you guys have, was it helpful? Was it something you were able to practice? And if anybody has any example to share. feel free and go ahead and click on the little hand raisey thing if you want to uh might be a tough ask but let's see if somebody can yeah. can come up on the spot the way that you applied situational leadership over the past year because i believe this was a new topic last year if i recall correctly. right yeah so i want to see if people kept this in mind nobody Everybody went in and started being an expert. There you go. We got okay. So uh, Lodum's got his hand up. Go ahead, Lodum. Yeah. So, um, situational leadership. I think I've seen a lot of it um, throughout the season. Um, 
and during the preseason, especially when uh, new members are coming in, um, seeing many different people uh, learning about so many different things, seeing all the leads, um, like following all of these steps um, to really create an environment where people can learn. And also, personally, I remember at Worlds uh, last year, um, I learned a lot about strategy and um, how match strategy is designed from Aiden. And um, there was a lot of um, coaching and supporting involved in that. Nice. Thanks. Yeah, so you you were seeing that evolution of the style, right? From the beginning stage to coaching and you getting yourself a little bit more skilled in the task. Great. Adam, you have an example too? What thoughts? Is that me? Or... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Ah. Um, I um, think Lodum covered a lot of the more general examples I would give, but personally, uh, I did a, I've been doing scouting admin for about a year now. And just with match scouting, you see, you don't really see a lot of uh, directing because most of that happens pre competition. But you see everything from coaching to delegating, depending on who's scouting and how much support they need from match to match. Hmm. So more, more delegating in that scenario, because you already have people who are familiar with how to perform the task. Yeah. OK, that's good. Good. I'm glad. I mean, so, you know, I'm glad you guys are sharing these thoughts, which are resonating with some of the theories being applied, but you know, may, you may not be sort of labeling it as situation leadership, but it's just one of those frameworks, which naturally comes if you are familiar with how to perform in those situations. So thanks for sharing. Right, so let's move on. So let's do a breakout session and uh, maybe take a few examples. I think similar to what you guys were sharing as well. Uh, there are a few scenarios to consider here and what we want to uh, have from you is that, you know, what are some of the development levels you would relate to in these scenarios uh, and share them back. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, if you want to elaborate a little bit more and we can then break out into the session. Absolutely. Um, so we've, we've got four scenarios here for you to consider. Uh, you don't need to start with the first one you probably won't have time to make it through all four. So pick pick one or two perhaps um, to focus on. And so to provide a little bit more context of these, um, some of these should be, some of these are familiar because we've been doing them, hopefully familiar because we've been doing them in the preseason. So for example, the first one is cleaning and servicing our MK4i SWERB modules um, in preparation for a preseason chassis. Um, the second scenario is more looking to the future and imagining what that will be. Um, determining our high level strategy and design requirements for next year's game. Um, but we can base that on our experience in, in the past. Um, our third scenario is checking the contents of the emergency toolbox again, make sure um, before we pack for the world championship. And the fourth one is um, to write custom code for analyzing uh, multiple April tags. April tags are those like QR code looking things that are read by the camera on our robot. Um, that we use to determine the position of the robot on the field. So for the scenarios that you discuss in your breakout rooms, um, what are some examples of the development levels that relate to those? Um, and that that wonderful graphic that was on the previous slide is also in the handouts, which I just pasted in the chat again. So you can pull that up to guide your discussion. Um, and then based on those development levels, which leadership style would be appropriate for the scenario or scenarios that you're discussing. Um, we are going to have uh, breakout rooms report back out 
Um, so please also discuss who is going to uh, speak on behalf of your, your group. So I'm going to open the rooms now and get everybody going. Here we go. Five minutes again, just like before. All right, welcome back everyone. So we're going to hear from a few rooms. Um, so if you'd like to share um, what your room discussed in terms of, uh, please just focus on one scenario. I think that'd be great. Um, go ahead and raise your hand as your room spokesperson and we'll hear what you've got to say. Uh, go ahead, Aaron. Um, I think we focused most on scenario three, which was the checking the comps in the emergency toolbox. We said, generally speaking, we'd probably want to put a a uh, more expert team member on that task because it's so important to our going to championships. We want to be able to delegate it, but at the same time, we thought it might be a good idea to go somewhere in between delegating and supporting and assign maybe a pair of members, one new, one experienced, so that we can guarantee a level of quality while also teaching the task. I love it. That sounds great. I thought I saw another hand. Oh, Ben, I did see a hand. There you go. Go ahead. Uh, we talked talked about the MK4i swerves. Um, so we said it's definitely an easy thing to do the edge method on. So like someone who is more experienced and knows what they're doing can do one and show like a group of people. And then um, since there's multiple, uh, the people who are watching can start to try and do it, like try and help clean the other ones and service them. So it's definitely a great use case for the edge method where you can like be there, show them how to do it, coach them through it. And like, they can demonstrate what they've learned. And like, if you do it again, like they can show what they've learned and if they even need help still. We're gonna be doing that a lot too. So that's great. Yeah, I think that's great. Ayush? Yeah, we also talked about the first one with the MK4i, and we were kind of in between, like, the coaching di and directing, like, that high supportive and, like, the directive um, kind of be, like, giving clear um, instructions on kind of directing them in the right direction, but also making sure they're kind of, they can get hands-on and kind of get that learning experience while you're also there to basically support them and make sure that they're going in the right direction and not doing anything they're not supposed to. Any thoughts, Mr. Gupta, before we uh, take a look ahead to team player stuff? All good. I think uh, good examples. And again, adapting those, not just based on the, the task at hand, but based on the strength of the, the team member and the urgency as well. So let's move on. All right. So one thing I want to share with all of you, regardless of your role on the team, is that all of us and everyone on the team is a servant leader at times. Um, there are times when we will be listening, noticing, um, and then acting to, to remove obstacles um, for others. Some of you are servant leaders like almost all the time, and, and that's, that's great too. Um, beyond that, all of us all the time are team players. Um, we're all part of the team. And so there's a mindset that we can adopt to help us uh, be successful as a team. And so I want to generate some ideas related to this. Um, so I've changed over the poll. It's the same link as before. And to make everyone's life easy, I'll put it in the chat again as well. Um, again, I'd like a three word response, three words separated by a space. When I say team player mindset, what do you think of? What pops in your head when we think of a team player mindset? You are welcome to think back to previous leadership workshops. You're welcome not to do that. <laughs> whatever, whatever works in terms of your idea generation. 
I'm going to give everybody a little bit of time to start typing into the poll, and then I'll switch over so we can see that. Actually, it may not be open. Hmm, let's see. All right, there. Now it's actually open. These are great. And this idea just popped in my head. My hope for a new member is that if I were to ask them at the end of the season to describe all the different team members they interacted with, they would use all these words. They'd be like, oh, they're supportive and helpful and collaborative and humble, um, selfless again. This is great. These are really good. So we've tried to distill all of these fantastic descriptors of what it means to have that team player mindset um, into a few different strengths. So the poll will stay open, I think. Yes. And so keep, keep working on that. Um, so here are six strengths we've identified um, of a team player. And for each of these, I, I have a certain uh, descriptor of that strength um, and then kind of a, a, or I guess a label for that strength and then a descriptor underneath. Um, and so we're going to explore these uh, together in a couple of different ways. Um, so for example, I've got being humble and self-aware that showed up on, on the list, being disciplined, uh, being compassionate. That was in our word cloud, courteous. Um, or similar words showed up there, being transparent, having that growth mindset. These are our, our six strengths. Um, they're numbered starting at zero because we're about to do a breakout um, where each breakout room, one, two, three, four, and five, will be discussing strengths, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so I'm giving you a little heads up in terms of that. Um, if you forget which strength is associated with your breakout room, this slide is also in the handouts, so you can look there as well. So here's what we're going to do in our breakout room. Um, we're going to assign, like I just did, I assigned each of you um, a strength. I want you to discuss um, as a, a group a broad strategy of how you could apply that strength, um, and then a specific example from your experience on the team that uh, illustrates that broad strategy. Um, we're gonna share these out when we come, we come back. Uh, this time we're gonna do four minutes for our breakout room. So you're gonna have uh, three minutes on the clock and then one minute warning um, before you have to return. What I've just asked you to do, I feel is a little bit abstract in terms of like, well, what do you mean like a broad strategy of applying that strength? Um, strength, or what do you mean about a specific example? So I'm going to model an example. That's why the number started at zero um, before I send you off in your breakout rooms to have this conversation. So here is my example of humble. Okay, so humble was the strength that was uh, number zero. And the specific strategy here um, is standing on the shoulders of giants. Okay, that's a term you may have heard in general and certainly in, in first robotics. Um, there's also the, the quote from Steve Jobs, good artists copy, great artists steal. Um, in business, we call this the make versus buy decision. And all of these are different examples of we have a problem to solve and what approach are we going to take it? What are we going to invent? Um, and what are we going to build on top of that other people have already done and proven? Um, there was a point on this team where we did not embrace this, this principle and the strength. And we felt like we had to invent everything. Um, and it made things really hard <laughs> to 
to invent everything from scratch every year. Um, and, and we've come a long way uh, since then. Um, oops, I'm sorry. I clicked the wrong button. Um, we've come a long way since then. Um, and we've learned that standing on the shoulders of giants does not limit creativity. Um, it does not limit invention. Um, it just helps us make more informed decisions um, because the creativity is still needed to adapt the ideas we see to other ones. So specific, so that was my general um, strategy. Um, here is my specific example. In 2022, so a couple of years ago, um, or a couple of seasons ago, uh, we decided we were trying to decide what we were going to do for Swerve. Um, and we started by researching the best commercial available Swerve modules. We actually had one of our own Swerve modules that we designed in-house, and we had made a second version of that. Um, we did all the pros and cons. We evaluated the stuff. We built our own Swerve chassis. Um, and then in the end, we decided to purchase the MK4. Um, and the year after that, the MK4i, now that we uh, uh, are using. Um, so that's one example. Another was just from last season. So this may resonate with more of you. Um, April tags were a brand new technology last year. We've never had them before. Um, so we evaluated the performance of different solutions. We looked at WPI Lib, which first provides. We looked at Limelight, which is this standalone product you can purchase and we'd used in the past in a different way. We looked at the open source Photon Vision. We looked at writing our own software. Um, and in the end, we decided, hey, let's use Photon Vision. This is the best solution for our team. And that was very successful as well. And there's many other examples of, of being humble and standing on the shoulders of giants. All right. So now we're going to send you off again, three minutes plus one. You're assigned a particular um, strength to focus on. And when we come back, we'll share out. I'm going to open up the rooms now. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we want to, we're getting close to the end here, and we want to make sure we honor our commitment to be done by 930. So we're going to focus just on two strengths for now. So apologies for the other three groups at the moment. Um, but we want to hear what room five has to say about growth mindset. So would someone from room five share out what, what your group discussed? Um, I don't know how to raise my hand, but that's fine. I'm we can hear you. It's great. <laughs> okay. So for growth mindset, our broad strategy was practice, practice makes better. And instead of using practice makes perfect, the distinction is so that instead of always striving for perfect, which is not like an achievable standard most of the time, you should always strive for practicing to be better. In our specific example, was kind of also a broad, broadish example where if we're trying to implement and test a new method and it failed, instead of having the failure act, like instead of having it speak and take it as like something for your character that you know you're a failure or anything else that's negative, you should see it as a gate for a new opportunity to improve. I love that. I think that's fantastic. Let's also hear from room four about transparency. That's a, a strength we haven't talked much about tonight, unlike some of the others. Um, we talked about how just like a broad strategy would be, whether it's like delegating or having a crucial conversation or anything like that, just make sure that you are always uh, talking about like the thought behind like the thought process behind everything because communicating that makes it easier for everyone to understand where you're coming from and they're also going to have like a lot more respect for you if you like take accountability for um what you're supposed to be doing and then our like specific example was um like pit updates and stand up um so those are just like really effective parts of like communicating with our team and making sure everyone's on the same page um, so that everyone knows what's happening. I love those examples. Those are perfect. Yeah, this is great. Sometimes um, when we're trying to have that adopt that team player mindset, it can be challenging. And so I'm not gonna read through all of these here. Um, Actually, all of these questions are captured in Trello reference on the reference board in Trello. Um, 
And so if you feel stuck, if you feel unsure, um, if you notice another team member who looks like they might be stuck or unsure, you can certainly have a conversation about adapting, adopting a team player mindset, um, and you can share with them this resource of, hey, when I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing or how I'm supposed to, the, the mindset I'm supposed to have, I look at this card in Trello and ask myself some of these questions, and it helps me know what, what to do. Um, so I think these can, these can be good too. Um, you can think of our team kind of like a swerve drive, okay, where we have lots of, but, but more than four modules. We have a lot of modules in our swerve drive. And so if we want to move effectively in the desired direction, we all have to be aligned the same way or else we're fighting each other and the robot's not going to move. Um, and so from my perspective, adopting this team player mindset helps us um, be like a swerve drive where we're all pointed in the same way. The last thing we want to do here in the next few minutes um, is we've created three scenarios here, um, and we're just going to discuss these in the chat. So what I'd like you to do is I'm going to be quiet for a minute and give you a chance to read a scenario. Just pick one, one, two, or three, doesn't matter. Um, and you can just start typing as you're reading in the chat um, what your thoughts are on those scenarios, and then we'll share these out, and I'll summarize some of them. Um, before we run out of time. So I'll stop talking now. All right, I was quiet for a little bit there. So go ahead and keep typing in the chat. When you have your response, go ahead and hit enter. Um, read through these after you've you've answered yours. I'm going to highlight some of them as we go here. Um, this will be our way of kind of getting some closure here on this topic of servant and situational leadership. I see a response here to, to number one. I love this first part. Ask them if they would like help. Always ask permission. Um, I'm in a new role this year where I spend most of my day coaching teachers. And one of the first things I was trained on is always ask permission. Don't assume someone wants help. I think that's fantastic. Um, yeah, we want to make sure they feel included and they want to come back. All right, more thoughts on some of the other scenarios. All right, number two, put the gusset and bolts in the proper place, probably a feature tote. Start cleaning up. Share your confusion, ask for help next time. I love it. It's okay that it's not gonna be finished. I love, love that reassurance too. 
and you don't try to rush and bolt it on in the next 10 minutes. I love it. Um, yeah, there's a, that's a, another perspective for being humble, right? Like we're, we're not going to finish that. Um, and that's okay. Um, we're going to be transparent so everyone knows what's going on. Yep, there's the breadcrumbs. I love the breadcrumb reference. We'll see more of that later. More cleaning up stuff. A lot of comments here on number two. We see number two every night. It's great to see these perspectives on it. I'm going to speak briefly, I think, to number three, unless someone's about to hit enter. Jay's about to hit enter. Excellent. Um, divert all resources to troubleshooting the issue. Most experienced members and mentors recognize when it's crunch time versus a learning opportunity. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jay. That's that's exactly what I was going to share. Number three is a hypothetical. This happened two years ago at the World Championship. Um, and uh, in this particular case, it uh, wasn't Edge. Um, I just stepped in and diagnosed what was going on and determined the robo reel was broken, had to be swapped. Um, and we swapped it and we got back out there for the next match. Um, and so, but, but here's the other part too, which I kind of want, this is a nice closing moment, perhaps. Um, that was the choice made in, in the situational leadership style adapted in that particular scenario. But the next fall, when we got back together, um, I sat down with the electrical team and talked through the troubleshooting process that occurred field side at the world championship and how we were able to determine what the issue was um, and troubleshoot that using the tools available, trying to build that capacity so that if this were to happen again, and we hope this will never happen again, <laughs> um, we have more capacity on our team to, to address it, um, which is what we're all going for there. So perhaps that's an example of playing the current game, prioritizing the current game, but still looking toward the next. All right, it is 9.30. We have four more of these coming up in the next weeks. Next Monday is Crucial Accountability and Influence. Crucial Accountability may be familiar to you. Crucial Influence, that part is brand new. So there'll be something new for everyone. And then we have three more after that. Um, and what the quote I want to leave you with this evening is a leader is best when people barely know she exists. When her work is done, her aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. So thank you to Mr. Gupta. Thank you to our guest star, Mr. John, for helping out this evening. Um, please do take a moment either tonight or tomorrow to click on the link for the 2023 Keep Fix Try. It's also in the handouts. Share with us your feedback. Um, we do read these and they do drive future leadership workshops. So thank you everyone for your participation tonight.